Okay, guys, can you guys hear me? All right, I think for some reason, we still have some students kind of join the class. Let's give it one more minute, okay? Before we get started, let's give it one more minute. It's always the case, especially for the first lecture. So people get confused how to use the system, so on and so forth. Let's give it one more minute. So we still have some students having problem logging to our system. Just give me one sign, okay? Because normally you shouldn't be asking for a password. Okay, got it. Okay, Sorry. I see Joey is here. Okay, no worries. Yeah. For some reason, because like I think these days, Zoom really hardening their security configuration. Previously, if I generate a URL, if you have the URL, you no longer need any password. But these days, for some reason, even though I give you the encrypted URL, sometimes some students still need some password. Just give yeah, it okay. one more minute, okay? One yeah, because um, recently there's like a security issue with Zoom. Someone mm -hmm. hacked the Zoom server, so. Exactly, because like the Zoom ID are like so patternized, right? You just like try different numbers. You can actually write a script. You can just try all the ongoing Zoom IDs and you'll be able to just basically squeeze in for some Zoom meetings. So one more minute, okay, before we get started. There's some still parents, students, they have a problem logging into our system. Yeah, because previously the Zoom is just like a regular, you know, like an online webinar applications. Well, these days it becomes more and more popular. Everyone needs to use the Zoom. So that's pretty much the reason. Okay. All right. So I should be there. I'm just going to close this. All right. I think pretty much everyone already gathered stuff and we can get started. Okay, guys. You guys are actually in the advanced and math, mathematics thought lecture. I think pretty much everyone we have seen each other before in different lectures. So I don't think I'm gonna do the same thing one more time, letting you guys what is the rational, so on and so forth. Basically, we're gonna keep the same thing as we did before. We have our lecture. After the lectures, we have our assignment, right? And you have, for this time, you have two weeks to finish the assignment because these lectures are considered to be very challenging. As you can see, the sample problems I give you give your parents already. So you have like two weeks to understanding, to basically understand the lectures and also, you know, try to do the homework. Okay, that's basically how it works for our lecture. And uh, before we get started, I wanna give you another information is that for this lecture, we're no longer talking about anything section by section. This is what we did before, right? We break them into different sections and I try to be more focused on one topic whenever we're in a section. Let's say the number theory, we just did it. I'm trying not talk too much regardless, like besides the number theory. However, from this lecture, everything becomes more like blended together. We focus on the mathematical thoughts. So the, math, math, the mathematical thoughts will be supported by questions for sure, right? Um, I won't be able to just basically tell you all the general things without going to the problems. Well, the problems I'll be giving you guys will basically cross the entire sections in mathematics can be the first problem we talk about the trigonometry, second problem we jump to the number theory, and then next problem we go to sequence, so on and so forth. So a basic requirements for you guys is that you need to have a good understanding for pretty much all the sectors in mathematics. If you still have some problem, don't understand what does trigonometry mean, this class might not be good for you. Okay, so this is the basic information. And uh, I hope you guys can turn on your camera because while I'm doing this, 
because this is considered to be a high level lecture. You guys might see each other future, in the future, like in the CMO or something. I don't know. So you can turn on your camera. So make sure you know each other in case you see each other in the, you know, the camp or so on and so forth. It's up to you. It's not a hundred percent compulsory. Again, like I keep saying, if you have any problems, sometimes you can basically put it on your face. So if you have, if you can read your face, sometimes it's going to help me to understand, you know, where we are, so on and so forth. But it's not a big deal whatsoever. All right, I think that's pretty much, I think that's the most um, brief start that I ever had before. Pretty much everyone already known it. So let's jump to our problems and our lectures today. So this is the mathematical thought lecture. As you guys probably know that mathematical thought, we have so many thoughts, right? And the construction, proof by contradiction, so on and so forth. In the first session, we have two sessions for our lecture. Each session lasts for 10 lectures. In the first session, we're going to go roughly eight different mathematical thoughts in our first session. And uh, the first one we're going to go is the construction method. So this is our lecture number one, construction method. Lecture one, construction. Well, I got to say the construction method is actually one of the most mysterious method in the mass competition. You know what, the, when I would say the mysterious means whenever you see the official solution of a, a high level mass competition, people always say, how come they come up such a solution? They need to create such a thing in order to blah, blah, blah. Yeah, this is actually, it really you know, speaks for itself construction you know construction the word means you're creating something right you're creating something basically from nowhere right so but i think from the mathematics perspective construction method even though it's very mysterious but we still have some evidence it, it doesn't really come from nowhere it has some basis so most of the basis are actually based on the experience you see similar problems before you see similar formulas before so all those kind of things come up together, you find out the construction method. I think the construction method, one of the most important thing I want to say, you can do from the similarity. This similarity has nothing to do with the congruency similarity. It means you see something from the appearance. This appearance looks alike. So therefore, you want to take the advantage from one section and then moving forward to the other section. This is pretty much all this construction thing comes from. Talking about the construction method, there are two major construction methods. So this part is more like the methodology part, okay? The two major construction methods. The first one we call it is the direct construction. Direct construction means you just solve this problem by constructing something. As long as you have something constructed, you will solve the problem. The other one, what we call it is the induction construction. The induction construction is even more complicated. You're not really doing one thing, one construction. You're going to try to do several constructions. And using something like the mathematical induction method, try to make it even more complicated and squeeze everything together, you get what you need. In today's lecture, we're not going to focus on the induction construction because we're going to leave it to the induction, the induction method. We need to have a better understanding of the induction method before we jump to the induction construction. So let's focus on the first part, direct construction. Direct construction, actually one of them is very, very useful. You're gonna see them from time to time is the graphic construction. Try to solve the problem from the graphics perspective. You maybe are looking at an algebra problem and then after doing the construction, you're kind of converting a pure algebra problem into a geometry problem or into a trigonometry problem. So this is basically where this graphic construction comes from. And I think 99%, I'm not like just roughly 99%, most of the graphic construction method are bind with the area method. As long as you have the, uh, like the figures or have your like graphs created, try to calculate some areas and then taking from there, you'll be able to figure out how this con direct construction works. I know this is a little bit vague to you guys, but let's spend maybe five, 10 minutes talking about the methodology before we jump to all the problems. So this is basically the two important methodologies for the construction method. And where to use the construction method? Applications. 
okay, there are several very important applications for the construction method. The first one is the inequality. A lot of inequality related problem, you're probably gonna use the construction method to solve it. Later, I'm gonna go show you some very interesting problems. You're gonna see that sometimes, you know, inequality is the most, is one of the most difficult part in the high level mass computation. Because from time to time, you need to do the, do the scaling, right? If you scale too much, you, you won't get what you need. If you scale too little, you also want to get, won't get what you need. You just have to skate the right amount in order to basically get what the author wants you to, to scale. So this is actually a very direct way to do the construction. The other way is likely the Diophantin equation. Right, we have introduced the Diophantin equation in our regular lecture. Diophantin equation means like an equa like a polynomial equation, which has more variables than the equations itself. Right? Let's say I have ax plus by equals to three. This is a Diophantin equation. You have four variables, and you are to trying to solve this Diophantin equation. Most of the time, it has infinitely many solutions. Well, the question I always ask you: Please try to prove such equation has infinitely many equations. I'll give an to give an example. I'm just trying this randomly. Please prove this kind of equation has infinitely many positive integer solutions, so on and so forth, or like at least the integer solutions, so on and so forth. So these kind of solutions, these kind of problems, most of the time, you can use the construction method to construct out the solution right away. All right. The number theory problem is for sure this is like a huge part for the construction. You're gonna create a lot of weird forms, weird relationships to make sure you can solve out this problem. And also the counting and the probability problems. You're still gonna do a lot of construction because coloring method, all those kind of methods can also be considered as a, a special kind of construction. Okay, so I think this is like a basic, basic introduction for the construction method. You know what, in Chinese we have a saying that there are a thousand hamlets in a thousand people's eyes. I, I have no idea if you say that in English. This is very famous Chinese like prob like proverb. There are a thousand hamlets in a thousand people's eyes. I'll say the same thing. Actually, there are millions construction method in a million people's eyes. You can never really figure out what is the right method, what is the perfect method. You always have a better method to solve this problem. So like I said previously, the construction method handles like a dream and keeps you one step away from the right answer. But the thing is that how can you figure out that construction method? Either you need to see it, see it before, or at least you need to dream it before. But I don't think you can dream it. So the purpose of our lecture is trying to figure out how you can, you can see something similar. So moving forward, you can use the same methodology to see the problems in the future. All right, I think that's a basic introduction for the construction method. I think we don't have too much to say because there's not really a black and white rule for us to say, okay, I always do such a construction. Let's try to see this problem in the real, real problems, how to use, the, how to feel the beauty of this construction method. Before I jump to the construction method lecture, I always like to ask you a question, like a, like, like a brain teaser or something. You know, we always have something. I give you three, I give you four numbers using whatever kind of uh, operations, right? To make sure, operators, to make sure this guy equals to 24. I think you guys should be very familiar with this, right? Okay, before I get started for the construction method, I'm gonna give you this. How can I create 24 by using four zeros? I'll give you 30 seconds to think about it for this problem. This is not really the construction we're talking about, but it really reflects the beauty or the nature of the construction method. Oh my God, Alan, have it. Have you ever seen it before, right? Or you just, you, or, or you just, oh yeah, okay. Oh my God, you just really find it out. You know what? That's the right answer. The plane is this game. Okay, that's fantastic. Yeah, that's the right answer. What I'm trying to say here is, this is pretty much all the problems we're going to talk about today. You must have seen this before. If you've never seen it, this is almost impossible to figure it out within 30 seconds. A construction method is like this. So hold tight. 
we're going to start our journey for today's lecture. All right, let's go to question number one. Oops, I'm going to delete it. I'm going to question number one. Yeah. For some reason, the question is no longer the same order like I created before. No problem. Let me um, just give me one sec. I'm trying to find our because normally it should go for like the right order, but this time it's a little bit uh, squeezed. No, this is actually question number four. Sorry about that. Uh, image. I'll go for the recent. Uh, short list uh, problem. What is the in positive integer solution? You know what? Okay, I'm just going to write it for you. For some reason, that one doesn't. Let A is greater or equal to C, B is greater or equal to C, C is greater or equal to C to zero. Try to prove such an inequality. C, A minor C, C, B minor C, and the root A, B. Okay. So this problem, as we can see, give me one sec, I'm gonna pull up this. This is a problem from 2008, Chinese National Mass League. In Chinese, we call it like Gaozhong Lian Sai. This is Beijing City pre-selection problem. Okay, at our level, this is how it works. I'm gonna give you two minutes every single problem uh, i'm going to give you 2 minutes think about it okay and then brainstorming first cuz at this level more and more i want you guys to participate in, in the process not i'm a blah 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 talking all the answers i'm going to give you the like my solution afterwards so 2 minutes think about it. how you're going to solve this problem i think alan already provided a solution that's like a pure arithmetic mean, geometric mean, which is fantastic, no problem. But try to use something different. Try to use something different. Yeah, James has the direct solution. You're gonna do a perfect square. Okay, try to get rid of like the old direct solution. Yes, try to do something different. Try to solve it in, the, let me give you a hint. Let me try to do this problem from a ge mat, from geometry's perspective. Exactly, from the, Geometry's perspective, no longer using the arithmetic mean, geometric mean. Every single problem, I'll let you guys think about it. Distance? You know what? You can unmute yourself and we can talk. I think that's, a, that's actually more efficient. I was thinking like maybe we can use a minus c and b minus c kind of as like distance functions um mm -hmm. and then when you're multiplying you kind of get this like shape i suppose mm -hmm. um, like a square or something i don't know how to deal with the square roots though because that's kind of awkward yeah no um, problem we're trying to have some ideas yeah. what do you think right that's the most important thing any other ideas i'll give you a hint if I can actually create some areas using these guys, is it possible or not? Trying to create some areas. You know what? Most of the construction method, they got, they're, they're gonna end up using the area method, right? This is what I mentioned previously. Well, the million dollar question is, how can you construct all those areas? Like I said, we're no longer doing the perfect square on the two sides of the equations or two sides of the inequality. That's more like the direct method, right? Now we're gonna use something a little bit different, trying something a little bit more smart. Is it gonna be area type of thing? If you can construct something using this as an area, 
you might be able to solve this. Yeah, I think Kevin wants to say, Heron's formula. Joey says triangles. I think that you're very close. We're going to go to the area, right? Area is the most important thing. Circle equation. Yeah. Always have some ideas, right? You know what? For question number one, let's jump to the solution first. You know, gradually by gradually, you have the more idea how to solve these problems. Okay, let's get started. I've already pre-recorded a solution for this problem. I think you guys can have a look. I'll be here all the time. First problem we're looking at comes from 2008 Chinese National Mass League Beijing City pre-selection problem. Chinese National Mass League in Chinese we call it Zhongguo Gao Zhong Lian Sai. It's actually preparation for the Chinese MO. So let's have a look. So for this problem, it says you have three numbers: a greater or equal to c, b greater or equal to c. C is a positive, so everyone is positive. Try to prove the following inequality. So if you want to do for the direct solution, trust me, this is not going to happen. If you want to do a perfect square on the two sides of the inequality, you won't be to, to get what you need because there's no relationship between A, B, C. You just basically do a random relationship, right? Just, just like A is greater than B or greater than C. Well, moving forward, since we're talking about the construction method, your first reaction is always try to construct something, right? Try to make it happen. And also, like we mentioned previously, most of the construction method, as long as you see the inequalities, you're trying to use the graphic construction. And most of the graphic construction is doing nothing but create maybe a triangle or maybe a rectangle or square. Barely you're going to do some circle. Just try to make it according to the condition, right? That's going to go to the, like the area of the shape you just created. And taking from there, you'll be able to find out all the relationship, right? We need to be on the same page. That's the basic direction for the construction method. Right, a quick observation. Let's have a quick look. On the left-hand side of the equation, there are actually under root C, right? You can actually extract out under root C. And the right-hand side is actually under root A and then under root B. You won't be able to do too much on the right-hand side. Well, the left-hand side, actually, you see two terms. Their product goes to like whatever, whatever. So your first reaction should be, you need to construct a rectangle and make sure these two guys force into those two sides of the rectangle. And taking from there, you might be able to do some magic and figure out how this inequality works. You see, this is the big direction because your observation shows maybe two terms times together, these will be the two sides of the rectangle. So that being said, we're gonna do such a construction to solve this problem, okay? Construct a rect like a rectangle, A, B, D, E, and for sure, this guy will be under root C, right? And the second part is how can I allocate these two parts? Actually, what, what, what I will do is that I'm just gonna find a point C on the side BD, for instance, and I wanna make sure BC equals to under root A minor C, CD equals to under root B minor C, all right? So therefore, you're gonna have alpha here, and this guy, if you use the basic Pythagorean theorem, this guy, AC will be equal to under root A, EC will be equal to under root B, right? These are basic, basic Pythagorean theorem. As long as you have such a shape, what you're gonna do is try to list out all the relationship talking about the areas, right? Because an area is important. So your area for the quadrilateral, A, B, D, E, will be equal to triangle ABC plus triangle ACE, plus triangle ECD, right? Okay, let's have a quick look. Triangle ABC, under root C, one minor, under root A minor C, divided by two. Triangle ACE, we're gonna use the sine law, right? Under root uh, A, under root B, divided by two, sine alpha, right? And then moving forward, triangle CD will be one over two under root B minor C under root C, right? Because this is a rectangle, so this guy will be C as well. 
All right, this is one way to denote the area of rectangle A, B, C, D. And at the same time, like we said, the only reasoning why I did this construction because I want to use the two values as the two sides of this rectangle. So rectangle A, B, C, D can also be right at under root C, under root A minor C plus under root B minor C, right? This will be exactly the same as we need on the left hand side of the inequality, right? So far so good? So moving forward, I just try to do a little bit analysis because I need to figure out this inequality. But this is an equation. Equation, how can I change an equation into an inequality? Very understandable, you have a sine alpha here. Sine alpha will be always between zero and one, right? So that being said, this guy will be lesser or equal to one over two under C, A minor C plus under root a uh, one over two under root a under root b right because i let sine alpha equals to one and i continue b minor c c okay this is c this is under root a minor c under root b minor c put them together trust me if you do some quick analysis you'll figure out this guy will be exactly what you're looking for here do some quick uh, rearrangement, you'll be able to get under root A minor C times C, under root B minor C times C, lesser or equal to under root AB. Okay, this is a fairly direct construct. You use the graphic construct, but the entire process is fairly understandable, right? Try to construct a rectangle, a triangle, a circle, whatever, whatever, and try to make sure whatever you want to prove on the left-hand side or right-hand side can falls into the two legs or like the two sides of the rectangle and you'll be able to solve this problem. So far so good? That's question number one. Any questions? So try to understand the beauty of the construction method. Let's go to the second problem, okay? Let's go for the second problem. So the second problem, as I'm presenting here, this is a problem, you see, from 1993 IMO pre-selection problem. So we have the real numbers x, y, z between zero and two pi, pi over two, prove the following inequality. Trust me, the first problem, you can still use the AMs, GM, arithmetic mean, geometric mean. Now what are you gonna do for the second equation? For, for the second problem, there's no way for you to do this in a direct way. Unless you're super familiar with this trigonometry identities, trust me, solve the trigonometry identity problem is even more difficult than the construction itself. So again, you are trying to use the area. Trust me, most of the time using the area to solve this problem. Again, I'll give you two minutes, to think about it. Let's try to have some brainstorming for two minutes. How are you gonna do such a problem? I'll give you a hint, you're still gonna use the area thing, but how can you squeeze in this area for this problem? Triangle, mm -hmm. can you elaborate a little bit why you wanna do the triangle? because the sine and cosine, okay. Yeah, that's a very good direction. Substituting this with this and you get pi over this, this, this. Okay, James, that's correct. What else? But after doing this, you're gonna be more go to the direct way. Oh yeah, you see James have a very good idea. Pi over four is the first quarter of the unit circle. Bravo, that's a very good direction. And what else you can do afterwards? James gave us a very good direction. You should use the one fourth of the union circle. But moving forward, what are you gonna do when you have the one fourth of the union circle? 
and everything of it, ah, that's amazing. Everything on the right-hand side fits in today. Exactly. You guys follow James? James has the very good direction. You're going to create a one-fourth of the uni circle and take him from there, figure out all the rectangles, whatever, whatever, try to squeeze in into the one-fourth uni circle, and you will be solved this problem. Again, try to do the observation and figure out how reach the direction you're going to say this, you're going to solve this problem. Let's have a look for the official solution of this problem. Okay. You see sine, cosine, just kind of weird things. Instead of ah. using the rectangle and triangle, that makes sense. you might use the circle. Because as long as you have a circle, you might be able to use the trigonometry to find out a relationship or just try to denote different segments using sine and cosine. So as long as you see the trigonometry inequalities construction, most likely you're going to use the circle. Okay? Plus, the question gives you a pi over 2. It really gives you a lot of hint. Maybe you're going to do some circle-related discussion to make it happen. All right, this is like the big direction for this. Again, even though it's for IMO pre-selection problem, as long as you know how to do the construction, like the entire solve process can be fairly quick. Okay, so for this problem, what we're going to do is we're going to construct a circle. Okay, I'm just going to draw the graph here. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a circle. Not, not, maybe not necessarily like the entire circle. One fourth of the circle will be good enough. Okay, just go for the first coordinate. We're going to figure out such a circle. So here, a little bit magic, what I need to do is that I'm going to find x, y, z, right? Because the question says x, y, z. These looks like three angles. Even though three real numbers between zero and pi, they're pretty much three angles, right? X should be lesser than Y should be lesser than Z. So that being said, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to randomly find these three angles. I'm going to do this. Let's see. I'll say this is X. Okay. The bigger one will be Y. And then the even bigger one, the green, the green one will be Z. Okay? That being said, it actually meets my condition. Right? So moving forward, I'm going to give some denotations. Maybe this is 0, and this is O, A3, A2, A1. Right? So I need to create the inequality. Now I know like the circle, like one, like um, one third of the circle, I know some triangles, but it's kind of difficult for me to find out the relationship, right? How can I create this inequality relationship to make sure I can somehow use what I need to figure out, you know, what I'm trying to prove? Well, the magic part for this question is that you can still gonna use the area, right? You're still gonna use the rectangles area or the triangles area. Right? So what's going to happen is you're going to do something like this. You're going to construct three different rectangles. I'm just going to put it here. So let's say we call this one S1. This blue one, we call that S1. Okay? The second one, maybe I'm just going to highlight it using this. I call this S2. The one in the middle. And the third one, I cut it as three. Okay? So with this, how can I get the inequality relationship? Because the million dollar question is I need to figure out the inequality relationship, right? Obviously, the inequality relationship based on the area will be S1 plus S2 plus S3 will be lesser than the entire one-third circle, right? That's where I find out this inequality relationship. All right. As long as I find out this inequality relationship, moving forward, I need to try to use X, Y, Z to denote all those three areas. Okay? Let's have a look. What, what, what about S1? S1 is actually the big one. S1 can be written as what? 
S1 can be written as sine z times cosine z. Is it right? Z is the green one, the big, big angle here. Sine z times cosine z. What about S2? S2, I need to find out what is the value for this guy, what is the value for this guy, right? For the height, I think it's easy. That's directly sine y, right? And what about this, the short one? The short one can be written as what? Cosine y minus cosine z. Is it right? Cosine y, cosine y is here. Cosine z, cosine z is here, right? So this guy will be equal as cosine y minus cosine z. And then the last one, S3, exactly the same thing. You can write as sine x, cosine x minus cosine y. Okay, let's have a quick look. This part is easy, right? Sine x. Well, this part will be written as what? The entire big one minus this part. The entire big one will be cosine x, right? And what about this part? This part will be the cosine y, right? Cosine y. So that being said, you are kind of denote the three areas using sine, cosine, x, y, z, right? And this guy will be lesser then pi over four, right? The pi over four is the entire uh, one, thir one third of the circle. You know what? Whenever you have this, you just try to do a little bit of rearrangement, you, you will be able to get pi over two plus two sine x cosine y, two sine y cosine z is greater than sine 2x, sine 2y, sine 2z. You're going to use the double angle formula. Exactly right, to figure what out the that. question asks you to prove. Of course, you're going to do some quick analysis. Figure out, you see, sine y times cosine y will be 1 over 2 sine 2y, right? This is where the sine 2y comes from. Yeah, this. This is like a high level lecture. I assume guys already have a very good understanding about the trigonometry identities. Instead of jumping, jumping to the calculation, I really wanna tell you guys the strategy. What is the mathematical thoughts between, behind all those calculations, right? A quick recap. For this problem, as long as you see x, y, z, they are kind of having a relationship between zero and pi. You might have a conditional react. Maybe this guy, we're gonna get involved with some trigonometry, some circle related area calculation to make it happen. Second part is the million dollar question is how can you construct this inequality relationship? Like I said, most of the construction, the graphic related construction, they are actually based on the area, right? And most of them are using either rectangle or triangle to construct all those area. So based on this, kind of intuition, what you can do is try to construct these three rectangles. Make sure the area of the three rectangles is lesser than one third or one fourth of the circle. And taking from there, you'll be able to figure out such an inequality relationship. Like I said, even though you go to the IMO, if you know the constructor, you can construct out what, it, what author wants you to construct. You can solve the problem fairly quick. All right. That's Okay, that's pretty much for this problem. All good? Okay, let's go to the next problem. Because in this lecture, let's just focus on the problems, okay? Let's do it as quick as possible. Okay, the third problem, you're looking at a problem from 2010, Korean Mass Olympia pre-selection problem. You see, they're pretty much using the same thing. The problem says you have X, Y, Z, alpha, beta, gamma, they're all positive numbers and they meet the following relationship. Alpha plus beta is greater than gamma, lesser than pi. Gamma plus beta greater than alpha, lesser than pi. Alpha plus gamma greater than beta, lesser than pi. 
if I use the human language, it means alpha, beta, gamma, if I pick up any two numbers, the sum of these two numbers will be greater than the third one or lesser than the pi, right? Okay, with all those information, prove such a weird inequality. Again, two minutes, discussion time. What are you gonna do for this? You, you, you can, you know, you can actually talk. Yes. Hey, Joey, yes. Triangles, because this looks really like a lot of cosine law, basically. Perfect. What else? Joey gave us a very, I think this is very conspicuous, right? It looks like very like cosine law, right? There are pretty much like three cosine laws, but the million dollar question is, how can you construct this cosine law? These are basically three independent triangles, three independent cosine laws. There's no way for them to really work together or make it happen. So the million dollar question is, how can I find out or construct this triangle? Triangle inequality. You can make them share sides. So like uh, two triangles with the, like, the same side. Mm -hmm. So like a triangle with a side, side length X and Y, and then with an angle alpha, and then mm -hmm. another triangle right next to that with a side length Y and Z and with the angle beta. But like that, that side length with a Y is the same like line as the other triangle, basically. Mm -hmm. of, you know. Then what about the third one? You, you guys follow James? James actually brought up a very good point. That's actually approach. That's actually the right approach. We're going to create some triangles because you need to find out the relationship, right? If, if there's no relationship between three triangles, they're basically working on their own. There's no way for you to solve it. We need to somehow squeeze out the relationship. James actually mentioned a very good point. You're going to make something share a side, right? Yes. But you have three triangles. How are you going to make sure the three triangles, they share their side? James, you want to elaborate a little bit or anyone else? Wait, what? So now you're talking about share size, which is fantastic. But you have three triangles. How can you make sure three triangles they're sharing side? Uh, OK, what, what you can do is kind of have like a duplicate of the first triangle on the end of like the, the third triangle, basically. Okay. Right, and then you basically use the fact that uh, the sum of the two angles, uh, of any two angles, is greater than the the third angle, and you also oh, yeah. use the fact that between zero and pi, uh, cosine is decreasing. Wait, yeah. wait. Uh, actually, I think you can do this. So basically, you construct a triangle with side lengths x, y, and the angle between it, um, alpha, right? Mm -hmm. And then on that same side length y, you construct another beta z. Uh, with a, a, a you turn that side length by beta and then you construct another side z so you kind of have like mm -hmm. three lines coming from a vertice mm -hmm. and then the first angle between those two lines x y is going to be alpha and then the second angle is going to be y and z and then mm -hmm. you connect the three points and create another triangle right mm. you connect the three the three end points of those three lines like not at the common vertice but the three end points so then you kind of get like a diamond almost and then after that, you just use triangular inequality. And then by triangular inequalities, because you know beta, you know beta has to be less than a plus a plus y, right? So you just assume beta is equal to a plus y. And even if it's equal, then it doesn't work. So if it's less than, it's going to be a smaller side length. Yeah, I think Joey actually solved this million dollar question. James actually gave us a very good point, right? You're going to make some triangles share some size. One and two share, two and three share. Well, the million dollar question is how can I make one and three also share something, right? So Joey actually figured out something. And, and also James said, you wanna duplicate the first triangle, you know what? So these are all correct directions. But look at the official solution. Official is actually even smarter. They try to solve all those kind of problems we're trying to discuss using a very elegant way. 
let's have a look. How, how are we gonna solve this problem? Just a reaction is we wanna do some quick observation. So these guys, these guys, they look like what? They looks like the cosine law, right? The cosine, like the cosine law, excuse me. Cosine law. Okay, most of the construction were actually based on the similarity. If you have something similar that really gives you a hint or inspiration, you're gonna go ahead to do such a construction. All right, so that being said, we're probably gonna solve this problem from the cosine laws perspective, right? Second part is, because the question doesn't really give you anything, how can you get started from nothing to create an inequality? Right? This is a question you need to ask for yourself. If you have a lot of conditions, you'll be able to do the construction and then based on the conditions to figure out what the inequality is. However, for this problem, you have nothing. In order to create from nothing, you must use a very basic, basic, very intrinsic right, inequality relationship that you know in order to solve this problem. So in a triangle, what is the basic, basic inequality relationship? Everyone knows that it's gonna be the triangle inequality, right? A plus B greater than C, A plus C greater than B, you know, so on and so forth. So that's like the inspiration. How do you get where you need to get started? You have nothing, then you're probably gonna use something very intrinsic, very basic to get started. Second, because the form per se is very close to a cosine law, so you're probably going to use a cosine law to solve this problem. Well, with all those information in hand, you probably will come to a very, a very smart construction to create such a form, right? Such a shape. Well, this is the way how you're going to do the construction. Instead of doing a 2D one, so this time you're going to do a 3D construction. Yeah, that's the magic part for this problem. I You're think gonna the do a 3D the first one, the third one. In order to squeeze in the three sides and the three different angles. So you're gonna have a 3D shape, goes like here, okay? And first of all, it is very understandable, X, Y, Z, they will basically go for different size, right? So this is gonna be your Z, this is gonna be your, your X, and this is gonna be your Y, all right? The second part is you're gonna place all those angles. Alpha, beta, gamma is already the angles. So the angles will basically force into three different planes. The alpha angle is actually in the bottom plane. The beta angle is actually here in the CPB plane. And the gamma angle will be in the back plane. Okay, I'm gonna write it from here. So basically you have APB equals to alpha, which is the bottom. BPC equals to beta, equals to beta, which is the front plane. And CPA equals to gamma, which is the rear plane. Okay, as long as you have all those information in hand, this problem is just speaks for itself and proves for itself. Let's have a look. X squared plus Y squared minus two XY cosine alpha. This is nothing but AB, right? This is gonna be AB. Second part, Y squared plus Z squared minus two YZ cosine beta. This is gonna be what? This is gonna be BC, right? BC. And last one, x squared plus z squared minus two xz cosine gamma, that's gonna be what? That is gonna be AC segment, right? This is AC, this is BC. All right, ABC, they're actually in the triangle, then automatically you have AB plus BC, which is greater than AC. You see, such a problem, it goes like this. If you do not know how to do the construction, you wanna basically open the under root or do some perfect square, that's gonna take you forever. You can never solve it. However, as long as you know the construction, you'll be able to solve this problem in no time.
But of course, construction takes a lot of efforts to, for you to figure out, right? But you see, every single step, there are some reasoning. It's not like basically jump from the middle of nowhere. You see the similarity, you do the cosine law construction. You see no condition, but you're going to create an inequality, then you're going to use the basic, basic inequality in a triangle. So that's pretty much how you're going to solve this problem. All right. So far, so good. That's for question number three. Okay, let's go to question number four. Question number four is, okay, let's have a look at question number four. Question number four, I'll read it. I'll basically solve the problem altogether. This is a 1990 old Soviet Union mass competition problems. You have like 2000 positive numbers, not positive integer, just positive numbers. A1 is greater than A2 all the way to blah, 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 800, meets the following condition. The sum of this 100 number equals to 300. The square sum of this 100 numbers is greater than 10,000, okay? With all those information, try to prove A1 plus A2 plus A3 is greater than 100. Just before we jump to the solution, I'll say a little bit side talk. In the Delphantine equation, in the just the finished number theory lecture, we gave like the Delphantine equation, right? We saw something similar, right? But this is more, but that problem is everyone should be an integer. Because if everyone is integer, you can see that everyone will be, they can't be greater than 100, right? Because all the integer, blah, blah, blah. But for now, they're not integers. So not necessarily everyone can fit all the conditions. We need to do a little bit different. So this problem, think about it. Two minutes, think about how you're going to be able to do the construction and solve this problem. Uh, are we supposed to prove it for generally? Because you can be like any, you take any three integers. Exactly. This is a general proof. Not necessarily integers. They can be just real numbers. The question doesn't say any integers. They're all positive numbers. Prove this. Yeah, A1, A2, and A3 are, are the three largest ones. Uh, yeah, exactly. The, like the three largest sum should be more than 100. I feel like for this one, I would probably start with proof by contradiction. Just like let them all be smaller than 100 and see what happens. That's um, the official yeah, solution from the That's problem. what I tried to do. Yeah. Looking at it. So, so for construction, is this still geometric construction? Or like yeah, I think it's geometric. I think you can do a geometric construction. So, like, you basically, uh, I think you could try constructing a series of like squares, and then that's, see like that's amazing because, approach. Because yes, uh, yes. basically, what you can do is you assume I can construct. Uh, okay, so you have a one, a two, a one hundred is like a series of side lengths of squares, right? And they add up to a hundred. And then basically you, because you notice that a uh, 10,000 is 100 squared, right? So you take 100 squared and then you assume that you can fit these 100 squares inside, uh, inside, the, inside the 100 by 100 square. Oh, wow. That's, that's ingenious. Wow. I didn't think of okay, that. Okay. And then, like, and then you, I think you're able to come to some uh, contradiction after that because uh, yes. you can be like, uh, but, I, but I think a uh, contradiction saying that it's not possible to fit these squares inside a larger square doesn't contradict the general thing. Wait, it does because it says... Because you're saying like it doesn't fit in, right? But like squares is kind of already like a constraint on how the area should be like formed, kind of. What? I don't get it. Because you have A1 squared plus A2 squared all the way to A100. And then you have A1 to A100. Yeah, but like you're going to try and get a contradiction saying you couldn't fit all of these squares inside a square of side length 100, right? Yes. But if you, but if you uh, manage to prove that, would that prove that these, this, the sum of the squares has to be greater than or equal to 10,000? Oh, uh, right. Yeah, you have a point. Because yeah. um, a square with side length 4 has area 16. And two squares with side lengths two and three, they have a sum, um, like the sum of their areas are 13, but they can't fit in. Oh, yeah, that's so, true. Yeah, you have to. Ah, rip. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. 
So basically, we're on the same page. First of all, we're going to do the proof by contradiction for sure, right? Second, we won't be go for the algebra way. We're going to go for the geometry way. The geometry way, I think Joey has a very good point because we see the a square plus b square, like a a one square, a two square. Pretty much, we're going to create a bunch of squares like this, like size dimension squares, right? And then try to do some magic, blah blah blah, and then squeeze them into something to say something doesn't work. I think let's try to like the million dollar question. Is let's just think about how we're going to think for this problem. Most likely. You're going to do your construction, start your construction from this. Why? Because this is like a, like, like an equation. Equation is more something tangible. We can do our construction from there, right? And then most likely the contradiction will come from here. Is that right? You won't be able to do your construction from here and then find out the, the, like the contradiction from here. So you guys follow me? The first equation is more like to, to do the construction, or the second problem is more like help us to create the what is called the contradiction. If you do that the other way around, you're going to go to a disaster, right? All right. So this is the official solution, actually given by the Chinese, like a mass education pioneer, because the official solution given by the exam committee was like the pure algebra way. There's nothing but all those crazy calculations. Like this is the official solution that given by the Chinese pioneers. You know, just exactly like Joey mentioned, let's try to do a little bit of construction. I'm going to have a bunch of squares, right? Exactly just like this, because A1 square, A2 square, so on and so forth. I'm going to do something like this. I'm going to have this A1, A2, a three, you know, all those kind of things, right? Just the third the dimensioning problem, all the way to, let me say something here, all the way to A100, right? So that one is going to create what? A 300, altogether 300, is it right? All right. Let's, if, if that's the case, let me just try to cut it into three different. I'm just going to go back a little bit. I'm just going to cut it into three different 100 times 100. Oops. Rectangles. Does it make sense? I'm going to cut them into three 100 times 100, 100. All right. I think that's all my constructions. I have nothing to do about all those construction things, right? OK, think about it. Now I need to find out if this one is not valid, means a1 plus a2 plus a3 is lesser to 100, lesser or equal to 100, right? I'm going to say this is not going to happen. Let's think about it. If a1 plus a2, this is a1 square, right? a2 square, a3 square. If a1 plus a2 plus a3, they're not going to be greater than 100. So that being says what? If I take the second, everything from the second, everything from the second rectangle, uh, excuse me, everything from the second square. If I do a flip, everything will be able to flip into here, right? Is that right? Because the highest one will be, I don't know, maybe A4. A4 is for sure lesser than A1. If I do a flip, everyone will be flipped into here. Is that right? And something, everyone will be flipped into here. I can put A1, A2, A3 to here. It doesn't matter, right? A1, A2, A3. So that being said, all those kind of things can be squeezed in to the first square. And there must be something remaining here, right? Right? Because everyone's diminishing. But if that's the case, can you still want to make sure everything's sum? Is greater than 10,000? 
that one doesn't make sense. Is that right? That's the construction for this. You know, the thing is construction, every single method, you have a different methodology. Unfortunately, there's no way for us to summarize one, two, three, four, but everything you want to do for the what? All those um, squares, areas, relationships, so on, so forth, right? So this is actually how it works. It just basically, you just you can just basically put it, yeah, because it is so easy, you can fit in because A4 is actually lesser than A1 here. And the other one, I don't really care what it is. It can be squeezed in here, right? So everything that can be squeezed into this one and this one and everything will be done. You see, I think this proof, you're gonna put more human language rather than the mathematics calculation, but this is how this one works. So far, so good. This is question number four. Any questions? Okay. If all good, let's go to question number five. Question number five, this is a problem. Okay, I'm just gonna drag you to question number five. Number five. One, two, three, four, five. This is 2005 IMO question. Question number three. Inequality. Again, inequality. Inequality is favorite for the IMO. So XYZ, three positive real numbers such that the, uh, like the product of the three numbers is greater than one. Proof this. Okay. I'm gonna give you, first of all, I'm gonna give you the, uh, like the, what is called a direct solution, a direct solution given by the IMO, okay? And then I'm gonna give you a construction method actually given by one of the, one of the, uh, the, one of the students coming from Republica Moldova. He actually find, he actually find a super smart construction solution and he got a special prize for this. IMO is not only asking for the right solution, you can ask for a little bit like your, your way to solve this. So try to follow me for the official solution. The official solution still needs some efforts, but you can understand this is like the direct way how to solve this. Okay, the first solution is you pretty much do the arrangement, put everything together and cross your fingers, make sure you can do a little bit of factorization for the numerators, you solve this problem. That's for number one, but trust me, no one can do that. If somebody can do that, IMO won't put it into there because everyone goes to IMO, they're super good at calculation. So this is not gonna happen. Let's go to question, solution number two. Solution number two, this is actually a very common strategy for IMO. Whenever you see a problem like this and you see a condition, something like greater than one, trust me, most of the time you need to use this one. You can't really prove this problem as is. This is not gonna happen, trust me especially in the IMO. You always need to tweak the form a little bit in order to make it appealing, more appealing for your proof. So this is what's gonna happen. In order to approve this, I just need to prove this. One minus one minus one minus is that right i just basically do a, a quick tweak i just need to prove this okay why i'm doing this because like i said i have a one here maybe moving from there i might use a little bit magic to replace one by using xyz you know just to make it happen so in order to do this i'm just going to do a little bit of rearrangement just basically help me to cross out all those weird numerators. I just need to prove this. Okay, you don't need to really take the note. I will give you the lecture video afterwards because this is more high intensive lecture. So try to focus, okay? Because when I'm doing this, I'm actually doing something significant. Previously, all those denominators, they're not talking to each other. But after do this magic, everything sounds quite similar. At least I did like all the denominators, they're starting talking them together, right? 
But still, it makes life so difficult because I have a stupid five odor. I think for our human beings, we can tolerate up to three. I think it's, it's, that's pretty much the maximum. Go to five's odor. This is almost impossible to make it happen. So this part, you need to do a construction. How to make this part more appealing? Well, don't forget your X, Y, Z. Their product is greater than one. So this is the construction given by the IMO committee. So he used the Cauchy's inequality. So I'm just going to rewrite the Cauchy's one more time in case some students, they forget Cauchy. This is Cauchy's inequality, right? Right? This is the Cauchy's inequality. All right. He actually did such a construction. Let's just focus on the first part. X5, Y2, Z2, YZ, Y square, Z square will be greater or equal to X5. Um, you know what? I'm just going to make it a little bit appealing. Is that right? I just basically use the Cauchy's inequality. I'm not doing any magic because there's a five here. So you're going to end up having a two X to the power of five over two, right? And then taking from there, I try to squeeze out this part, X, Y, Z. Okay, you guys follow me? This is nothing but calculation, nothing really magic. This part will be greater or equal to one, right? This is the condition given by the question. So that part said, I'm going to be greater than x square, y square, z square, square. You guys follow me? Is it? Yes or no? All good, right? Yes. Yeah, all good. Perfect. So now you have this. Let's have a look. This is exactly your denominator. This part I don't really know. But this part also quite alike your numerator, right? So that being said, I'm just going to rearrange this expression. You're going to have this. Is it right? I'm not doing any magic. I just basically make this expression greater or equal to this square. I just basically rearrange it into here. I just split all the denominators and numerators, put them together. That's it. Okay. As long as you see, let's have a look. What is my goal? My goal is trying to see these three guys, their total sum is lesser than three. Look at that. I have already do the first part. Right? Thanks to my construction, I have this. I'm gonna do exactly the same thing for the second part and the third part. No magic, you just basically do this right now. This is for the second term. And this is the third term. You can forget about all the calculation details. Let's focus on the mathematical thought, OK? You just basically calculate out three. And then these three parts, they are exactly what you need on the left. Is that right? So you just have to add these three parts together. These three guys will lesser or equal to x, y, y, z, z, x, x square, y square, z square plus two, because something will be canceled out, OK? Because you have the x, y, you have all those will be canceled out. OK. This part, I say, is actually lesser or equal to one. Any objections? Anyone? I say this part is greater, this part is lesser or equal to one. Is it good? Yeah. Any? You can you can prove it easily by using um, trivial inequality. Yes? No? You don't really okay. have to do so complicated. It's like times two on the two sides. You can have uh, x 
minus y perfect square, y minus a perfect square, z minus x perfect square less or equal to zero. Is that right? So lesser equal to three. So far so good? This is more, this is, you use, you're still gonna use some construction, but this is more direct way to solve this problem. But this is not the focus of today's lecture. Today's lecture, I'm gonna show you the, the crazy solution given by one student. Using a crazy construction, he solved this problem in about 30 seconds. So this is kind of the beauty of the construction. If all good, let's go to our first official solution. Maybe 30 seconds is kind of like too fast, but uh, let's check it out from here. Like a student come from Moldova. His name is actually, let me see his name. Is maybe actually, not 30 seconds, maybe one, one minute. <laughs> Bori, Boriko Iri. Iuri. Boriko I, Iri, yes. He actually find out a solution purely by using construction, which can significantly reduce the complexity of this problem. And this is actually his solution. I'm gonna be showing you guys today. Again, he's actually using construction. In order to use construction, he needs to have a little bit inspiration, maybe not, not a little bit, a huge inspiration in order to find out a very shortcut way to solve this problem. And I'm gonna be showing you what he find out in his solution, all right? So a quick observation for this problem is that you can find this problem is actually also a cyclic symmetric problem, right? X, Y, Z, they're kind of like cyclic symmetric. As long as you can denote the one expression for X, Y, Z, this is going to be applicable for the other expression, right? This is what we can find out. So actually for Barico's solution, he actually find out something like this. By a quick, quick observation by the first term, he state, he basically present such an statement. X5 minus X square over X5 plus Y5 plus Z2. He find out this guy if I subtract the other guy. X5 minus X square, make sure the numerators are the same. But I'm gonna change the denominator a little bit into x cube, x square plus y square plus z square. If I just do analysis between these two expressions, this is what I find out. It's gonna be a big one, x square, x cube minus one square, y square, z square. The denominator becomes x cube, x to the power of five, y square, z square, x square, y square, z square. Okay, if you do some rearrangement between the difference of these two expression, he find out, okay, this guy will be actually greater or equal to zero. Is it right? Because the question says x, y, z, they're all positive integers and the product is greater or equal to one. So the worst case is everyone equals to one, right? So that's gonna make sure x square minus one, at least x cubed minus one to the perfect square, at least equals to zero. Most of the time, this guy will be greater than zero. Okay, so what he's trying to do, as long as he find out this, he find out something like the following part. The original expression, he put it into a sigma way because they're cyclic symmetric, so there's always easier for, to basic put them into this way, right? There's no magic, I just basically represent the form into a more straightforward denotation. X5 plus Y square plus Z square. So this guy will be greater or equal to sigma X cube, X square, Y square, Z square, X5 minus X square. Is that right? You just basically replace the original one by using this one, right? Well, this replacement looks like comes from middle of nowhere, but actually has ha it has a lot of significant contribution to this problem. Why? Because previously, a quick observation you can find out, all those denominators, they're very close, but they're not the same. 
in order to use them, you need to basically do a huge rearrangement, a huge rearrangement, put everything together, right? However, as long as you do this analysis, this construction, you find out this guy, you're gonna find out the OD denominators are actually exactly the same. So that being said, you can only work on the numerators or forget about the denominators, right? So this guy, I'm gonna do a quick analysis. This guy is not a difficult one. I'm just gonna squeeze out the X square plus Y square plus Z square as the denominator. This is gonna be sigma X square plus minus one over X. Is it right? I'm just gonna put uh, these parts together. It's gonna be X square minus one over X plus Y square minus one over Y plus Z square um, minus one over Z, right? So that one can be what? Greater or equal to, let me change it. Greater or equal to X square plus Y square plus Z square sigma X square minus Y Z. Is that right? I'll stop at here. Because don't forget, X, Y, Z, the product is greater than one. So I basically replace one over X by using Y, Z. You guys follow me? Okay, that's, the, that's actually where we come from. Because X, Y, Z, their total product is greater than one, right? So from here to here, I did a quick, uh, adjust, like a quick adjustment, right? One over X be greater than Y, Z. This is a quick jump from here. Okay, let's continue, okay? All right, so that actually gives you a huge simplification. As long as I know this part, I know because X plus Y plus Z is greater or equal to one. So that being said, this entire expression will be greater or equal to zero. That part right. also jump a little bit. Let me try to give you a little bit denotation. So what you can do is, Sometimes I just jump a little bit. What you can do is, what you're gonna have is the X square, Y square, Z square, whatever, sigma here, right? And then you just put everything here. This will be sigma, X square, Y square, Z square, then Y, Z plus X, Y, then plus X, Z, something. This will be exactly the same thing as we saw previously. So this guy will be greater or equal to zero. You guys follow me? This is not a magic part. You just basically put threes together and you'll be able to see this. This is, a, this is not a magic part. I just wanna give you another clarification since I think this is easy, so I just jump it during my, 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 my recording. That being said, it's a conclusion to this problem, QED. You see, a very complicated problem because you know such a great, great construction that you will be significantly simplified this problem. Well, I, I got to say, is not to figure solution. out this problem, you need, really need a lot of inspiration. Not to say, first of all, you're going to figure out how to do a construction, figure out how to find a such expression. Even though I could give you the expression, it might take you some time to do a simplification from here all the way to here, right? You're going to do a huge simplification to do a factorization, figure out all the terms. That one needs a significant effort as well. But you know, all your effort, all your this capability is not accumulated by one day or two, a day or two, right? It's actually comprehensive efforts from all over the places, right? So this is actually an IMO problem telling me that as long as you know the construction, find out a very smart construction, you will be able to solve this problem significantly quick. Okay, so far so good. To answer Andy's question, this is not official solution. It's a special prize solution given by a student from uh, Moldova. And the first solution I give you guys is actually the, the official solution. The using the Cauchy's inequality is more like official solution. This is more like- The first one is much easier though. It's more easier to understand, right? Yeah. Like, but his solution is a lot more faster. The million dollar question is how come he can figure out a weird expression like this? This, this is so confusing. <laughs> this is not from nowhere. He must buy, you either seen it or you, you need to dream it, right? You might, 
the, for, for sure, it, it doesn't come from nowhere. It must come from some from kind of accumulations, it's like similar questions, so on and so forth. So far, so good. Any questions? All good? All right, if all good, let's go to the other problem. Because like the construction method is like a thousand construction method is, can you resume your share? Okay, let's go to question number six. This is a 2001 USAMO question. This one is a, also needs a little bit of um, analysis. I'm gonna write a question myself. Okay, so this problem says you have three numbers, A, B, C, greater than zero, satisfy such an equation. With all this, trying to prove test parts. I can't remember like rich number. You can you can just do Google search, 2001 USAMO. I think it's number three. Oh, then, okay, number six. Okay, number six. Okay, Let's see, wait, everyone is there. Wait, you can just add the two inequalities. Wait, can you? I think you can, right? I can do what? Say no, because I don't think so. Like, you can multiply, you can, oh wait, no, never mind, you can't, never mind. Multiply, you should be very careful, right? Well, the, the first one is like, we know, but the second one we have to show, so I don't think we can combine them. Mm -hmm. Think about it, what are we gonna do for this problem? You know what, you are actually facing an inequality. The inequality have two sides, the lower boundary and the upper boundary, right? So you're probably gonna solve this problem from two sides, from like two different perspectives. How to figure out the lower boundary, how to figure out the upper boundary. But before we jump to my solution, yeah, I think I have already recorded solution. Let me try to give you something more inspiration. Why, I mean, I keep saying, whenever you do a construction, you never come from nowhere, right? Most of the construction must come similarity, something quite similar that you can do the construction, so on and so forth. Okay, a quick observation for this, three positive numbers, all those weird form equals to four, is that means A should be zero to two? You guys follow me in this part? Yes. All right. As long as we see this, who can tell me, according to our previous experience, what is your first reaction whenever you do some substitution or construction, so on and so forth? Quadratic? Wait, no. sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear. Um, what, why is A, uh, B, C between zero and two? Because the perfect square equals to four, and then you have A, B, C here then A cannot be too big, right? A should be lesser than two, is it? If A is a three, this is not gonna happen, is it? Oh, okay, yeah, right. Okay. Is it? Yeah, I was thinking of something else. Sure, yeah. just like very, if you have any questions, please let me know, okay? This is, because, yeah, I just wanna make sure we, 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 we find a speed that works for everyone. I'm still trying to find a speed that works for everyone. For the, those guys who are not asking questions, you also need to let me know if I'm moving too fast or too slow, okay? Let, let me know, then I can try to adapt my speed. Okay, my question for you guys is, as long as you see A, B, C, they're between from zero to two, blah, 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 who can tell me, or first reaction, what, what are you gonna do? If you want to do some substitution, some construction, what kind of magic you want to do from here? Uh, Who'd like to talk? Uh, complete the square? No. I'll tell this upfront, no. For, forget about this. I'm not asking this, I'm asking this. Whenever you have the range for A, zero to two, Jennifer has the right answer. Trigonometry 
substitution. Means A can be equal to what? Two cosine A, right? B equal to two cosine B. C equal to, oh, oops. C equals to two. Oops. Uh, give me one sec. Yeah. Two cosine C, is it right? This is a significantly important conditional react. Whenever you see a range for A, your first reaction will be always using the trigonometry substitution. Any, ob any objections? Are you guys following me? Yeah. This is this is extremely important. Try to use the trigonometry substitution, and you will be able to solve this problem, not in no time, but but significantly easier. This is a very important thing. As long as you see a range for a number, try to use the trigonometry substitution. I'm going to give you the official solution for this. Okay. Okay, the lower bound. So let's start from the lower bound, okay? The lower bound is easier. Lower bound. So the lower bound, you need to prove that zero is lesser or equal to AB plus BC plus CA, right? So before we jump to that, we can actually have a quick observation because ABC, they're all non-negative numbers and they have the perfect square sum plus ABC must be equal to four. So that being said, actually, we can find out what? ABC, they cannot be all greater than one, right? ABC cannot be all greater than one. Is that right? If everyone is greater than one, you can have the sum equals to four. So without a loss of generality, without a loss of generality, we can basically say let A is lesser than one. Okay? So I'm just gonna do a quick factorization plus ABC. You can actually factorize this expression into A, B plus C plus BC, one minus A. Is that right? Because A will be basically greater, uh, lesser than one. So this expression, greater or equal to zero, this is quite possible, right? This is quite possible. All right. If that's the case, I think here I'm, I should say greater A will be lesser or equal to one, right? So this expression should be greater or equal to zero. I think this is quite understandable. So that's pretty much done for the lower part. Well, more complicated thing is how are you going to do with the upper part? The upper boundary. How to prove AB plus BC plus CA minus ABC is lesser or equal to two? Trust me, focus on the if you want to do a direct this proof, is it is part. almost impossible. So you can't really figure out, like most of the time you can't you figure out a very direct way to prove this. If you check the AOPS, they have the official solution using the kochi schwartz inequality to make it happen, but you're still gonna do a little bit construction before you can really take it over. Well, from the constructions method, like way, the way I'm providing is actually a little bit different, the construction method. Like I keep saying, in order to do a construction, most of the time, you need to find some similarity, right? Your construction won't be able basically come from nowhere. It must be have some basis. You come from the basis, you figure out something similar, and then you do the construction. Well, this is actually a very important part. As long as you see such a form, you need to actually search out all your brain to find out whatever something is quite similar to this expression or not. Actually, there is one trigonometry expression which is quite similar to this form. And you probably want to find out how you're gonna do, I think this is plus, right? You probably wanna find out how to do the construction based on the trigonometry identity. So this is the trigonometry identity. For any triangle ABC, 
you basically have cosine square A plus cosine square B plus cosine square C plus two cosine A, cosine B, cosine C is actually equal to one. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this trigonometry identity or not, but this is actually quite common. You can easily prove this because C can be written as what? Pi minus A plus B, right? What you have to do is just basically plug in the value and then unfold everything, try to use some like a um, double angle formula and find out the relationship, you'll be able to do this. Trust me, this is actually a very important, a very commonly seen expression from the trigonometry's perspective. All right, if you can find something like this, a quick observation. These two part looks a little bit similar, right? These two part also look a little bit similar and so on and so forth. Everything, you know, this part also look a little bit similar. So that being said, basically based on this inspiration or hint, you want to do such an expression. You can let and two cosine a, two cosine a equals to a. This is what we introduced at the very beginning, b. right? Equals to why, b. Why you want to do this? And two cosine c equals to C. So that being said, if I want to prove a B plus BC plus CA, right? And then minus two AB, I mean minus ABC, excuse me, minus ABC, minus ABC, right? I want to prove this guy lesser or equal to two. What I'm gonna do? I just need to prove. Basically, you just plug in the value, right? You just need to prove what? Cosine A, cosine B, cosine B, cosine C, cosine C, cosine A, minus two cosine A, cosine B, cosine C, less or equal to one over two, is it right? You don't have to do any magic, you just plug in the value, you basically have to prove such an expression. Well, moving forward, how are you gonna find out the relationship between here and here, right? This is gonna be another magic you're gonna do, okay? Because like I said, in order to do this construction, you still want to use some very commonly seen formulas from time to time in order to basically organize your thought. So here you basically can do such a quick analysis. Let me just try to do this first, okay? If you want me to determine this guy is lesser or equal to one over two, let's say the left hand side or lesser or equal to one over two, right? I need to prove this. Let me just try to do some reorganization for, I mean, Try to reorganize the left hand side. I can actually extract out cosine A, then you're gonna have cosine B plus cosine C. And then you're gonna have a cosine B, cosine C here, cosine B, cosine C here. You're gonna have what? Cosine B, cosine C, one minus two cosine A. Is it right? All right, now, I need to figure out if this guy is lesser or equal to one or two, right? I need to find out the inequality in order to make it happen. Let me ask you one thing if you're familiar with all this. You wanna have cosine B plus cosine C somehow change into a inequality, is it right? You wanna have also this uh, one over, one minus two cosine A or cosine B times cosine C go to an inequality, right? That's the only way you can figure out this inequality to do the construction. Then you actually want to think about, search your brain and think about what is the very commonly seen formula in order to make it happen, all right? So here actually contains two very important formulas you can make it happen. In any triangle ABC, you're gonna have cosine A plus cosine B 
plus cosine c is lesser or equal to 3 over 2. You might find this is like a dreaming, but this is actually very real. In the any kind of triangle, you have a bunch of commonly seen trigonometry identities or inequalities. And this is actually one of them. Like the one we just mentioned previously, this is also one of them. Okay? So to prove this, this is not something too difficult. You can just basically, again, plus C as cosine pi minus B plus A. And then you can use some sum to product and you can basically make it happen. Okay, I'll leave this as a homework. You can think about it, how to prove this inequality. This inequality works for any kind of triangles. All right, if that's the case, you're probably gonna know that. Okay, let me just re rewrite from here, okay. Then cosine A, cosine B plus cosine C will be lesser or equal to 3 over 2 minus cosine A, right? 4 over 2 minus cosine A. Then what about this part? Cosine B times cosine C. And then minus 2 cosine A. Look at that. I already have a cosine A here, right? I'm going to have like a cosine A squared for sure. Well, the second part, I have cosine B, cosine C, cosine A. But on the right-hand side, what I'm looking for is a constant value. If I still keep cosine B and cosine C, this is going to be impossible for me to make it out, right? I need to somehow cross out cosine B and cosine C, only leaving cosine A. Let me repeat it one more time. This is important. Because I already see there's Wait, a cosine A, cosine A square in the first term, right? Well, for the second term, I have a cosine B, cosine C, and cosine A. I can't make it happen. There are three variables. This is impossible. And the right-hand side is actually constant. So I need to do some magic in order to get rid of cosine B and cosine C. Hopefully, I can retain only cosine A. And hopefully, I can use the kind of like the relationship between cosine A I mean, I can kind of use the range of cosine A itself to figure out the left-hand expression. Is it right? If at the end of the day, the left hand is also cosine A, and I know that cosine A should be not a huge number, right? So I know the range of cosine A, so I'll be able to figure out the total range of the expression on the left. Hopefully, that guy will be lesser or equal to 7 over 2. You know, this is where I come from. This is the rational behind that. All right, if that's the case, I have a cosine B times cosine C here. Okay, let's have a look. Cosine B, cosine C, use the very famous product to sum. It's going to be what? 1 over 2 cosine B minus C plus cosine B plus C. Is it right? And what about cosine B plus C minus cosine A, right? This guy, cosine B minus C, the maximum, maximum of this guy can goes to one. So this guy will be less or equal to one over two, one minus cosine A. Is it right? You see, this is more like a magic. I have to get rid of the B and C, only retain A. All right, so that being said, the second expression, the second expression will be less or equal to one over two, one minus cosine A, then times cosine A. Is it right? So far, so good? All right. I'm going to put everything together. So the left-hand side will be less or equal to what? Two, 3 over 2 cosine A minus cosine A square plus 1 over 2 minus cosine A square divided by 2. Is that right? I think so I that one will equal to, two, to uh, 3 over 2, of course it's minus, cosine A square plus 3 over 2 cosine A plus 1 over 2. Okay, don't forget, don't forget. This is actually a quadratic equation, right? This is a quadratic equation. And this quadratic equation, you have a range. Co I mean, you have like a a domain, cosine a squared will be 0 and 1. Is it right? 
cosine a square will be zero and one. So that being said, you can actually use the basic, basic quadratic equations range when the domain is in a fixed interval, right? I think you guys should have no problem doing that. So basically plug in, you will have basically this guy, the maximum, maximum will be one over two. You guys follow me? This is very important. You are having the quadratic equation and within this quadratic equation, you have a domain, right? Cosine a square will be basically between zero and one, right? So that being said, you'll be able to determine the range of this quadratic equation. So that being said, you can find out the maximum value will be one over two. All right, let's have a very quick recap, okay? For this problem, to prove the lower case, like the lower bound, this is fairly straightforward. You can just do a quick analysis, you figure out. Well, to prove the higher, like the upper bound, you need a little bit construction. So what we construct is that we change them into cosine A, cosine B, cosine C, all right? And then taking from there, I'm trying to find out such a relationship. And then I'm just gonna plug in the value one by one, right? I need to prove such. Left-hand side will be lesser or equal to the right-hand side, all right? And because I have three variables on the left, this is impossible for me to do the job. What I will do is that I'll try to get rid of some of the variables. Right? Because I see this cosine A times cosine B plus cosine C, we already know in any kind of triangle, you should have a such a relationship. Cosine A plus cosine B plus cosine C will be less or equal to three over two. So that being said, you'll be able to get rid of cosine B and cosine C only having cosine A for the first term. The second term, we're gonna do exactly the same thing, trying to retain the cosine A. So you're gonna have something like this, using the uh, product to sum. Everything plugging them together, you're gonna have a quadratic equation, has this domain in a specific range, right? So that being said, you'll be able to find out the upper limit of this problem. So far so good? That's actually for this USAML question. If you go to the OPS, you have like a regular, like a Cauchy Schwarz solution, I'll let them figure, I'll let you guys figure out yourself. But this is more like the construction way, how to use the trigonometry to solve this problem. If all good, let's go to, I think we don't have too much time left. Let's go for two more problems before we wrap it up. Okay, two more problems. I'm gonna show the next one problem. Question number seven, and this is an easy problem. I think compare with whatever we mentioned previously, this is a more direct problem. You don't have to think up too much. It's a 1999 Vietnamese, like a mass Olympia problem. ABC, three positive real numbers, plus AB, ABC, plus A, plus C equals to B. As long as you see this, they're not cyclic symmetric, right? So the way to be, a, B, C, they're not exactly identical. Please find the maximum value of this guy. This guy is not uh, such like the cyclic symmetric neither because you have a negative here and you have a three here. Is it right? So who can tell me? Again, don't go for the direct solution. Let's try to do a little bit of construction. I'm just gonna give you some hint. From this expression, who can tell me what kind of things are similar to this problem and how we're going to solve this problem using the construction method. Like I said, you're always going to do the construction based on the similarity. If they're totally not similar, don't waste your time. I give you guys 30 seconds. Try to do something, try to do some quick arrangement for this expression. Who can tell me what kind of formula looks similar to this expression? This is something you know, everyone you know for sure. Factor. So? Oh. Uh. 
Stephen has the right factorization. But my question is that try to rewrite, rearrange this expression, put it into something that you might look like, you might think similar to something that you already know. Oh, a AMGM. AMGM? No. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I just try to be more direct. <laughs> okay. No. Try to find something. If I give you a hint, another hint, I think this looks like one of the trigonometry expression we learned before. Who can tell me which trigonometry expression I'm talking about? Ten? No, wait, no, not ten. Cosine law. Uh, cosine law, you should have at least the a square, b square type of things, right? Joey actually has the right answer, but he didn't really inst insist to his right answer. It's 10, right? It's 10. Okay. Yes. I totally believed in myself. <laughs> you guys can see the tangent thing from here? Let's give him 30 seconds more for everyone to wrap up, for everyone to catch up. I say this week expression is quite like the tangent thing. Am I daydreaming? or I'm telling the truth. We kind of lost. I say this expression looks like a tangent identity. A tangent identity. Well, it's like sum of sum of two angles, right? Is that right? This is it looks like the tangent alpha plus beta. If you don't, if if you don't agree with me, let me just do a quick rearrangement. B actually equals to what? A plus C, one minus A times C. Is that right? This is look the tangent. If I put it this way, right? It looks very tangent, right? Okay, like I said, construction based on the similarity, right? So that being said, I might be able to solve this problem using tangent. So our basic let cos tangent alpha be tangent beta C tangent gamma. Alpha, beta, gamma are all between zero pi over two. Is it right? Because I've said they're all positive real numbers, like positive real numbers. So zero pi over two, make sure those guys are all positive real numbers. So that being said, beta will be equal to, tangent beta will be equal to tangent alpha, tangent beta, uh, tangent gamma, one minus tangent alpha, tangent gamma, right? That one will be tangent alpha plus gamma. Beta will be equal alpha plus gamma from zero to pi. Is that right? This is quite understandable, right? Any objections? Oh, good. Okay, if that's the case, my p equals to what? 2a squared plus 1, 2b squared plus 1, 3c squared plus 1 will be 2 tangent squared alpha plus 1, 2 tangent squared beta plus one, three, tangent squared gamma plus one, right? Okay, as long as you see this, tangent squared plus one, your first reaction should be, what kind of identity kicks in? Double angle. Huh? Double angle? It's too far away. Try to do something more direct. Oh wait, no, cosine plus sine, uh, sine sine squared plus cosine squared is one. Kevin has the right answer. Secanta, you, yeah. you don't have to go for so deep, right? Secanta square theta always equals to tangent square theta plus one, is it right? Any objections for this? Yeah, I think James, the right answer is, that's your, that's your direct solution. Yeah, it's cosine sine thing is, is another indirect way, but this is something you need to know right away. Is it right? 
Okay, so that being said, that's going to be two cosine square because the secant of square should be one over cosine square, right? Minus two cosine square beta, three cosine square gamma. So far, so good. Any objections? No. Okay, so let's continue. Okay, the following part will be the easy part. You just basic do play with your trigonometry identities, you get what you need. As long as you see this, this is, this is gonna be two cosine alpha, cosine beta, cosine alpha, cosine beta, three cosine square gamma, right? Who, who can tell me what should I do next? Don't forget, beta equals to alpha plus gamma, right? I'm, I'm gonna erase it here. Beta equals to alpha plus gamma. Who, who can tell me what should I do next? This is the conditional react. As such a level, you should have this conditional react just right there. You shouldn't even stop having such a conditional react. As long as you see this, what, what are you gonna do? Plug in. Uh, oh yeah, plug in is a good method, but we have something more high high techy techy. Yeah, plug in is always correct. But what am I gonna what am I gonna say is actually based on plug in. If you do the plug in, you get what I need. But at this level, we should have something more intuitive. Factorization? No. You're trying to use some trigonometry identity. Like I said, this trigonometry identity was tested every, almost every single year of AMC, even for AMC level, okay? You need to know this. Even for AM, cosine 2a, no, but close. I told you guys, something tested almost every other year, maybe not every single, every other, every other year. No, you guys, don't, you guys forgot, sum to product. Sum to product, yeah, like Kevin mentioned, sum to product. That's your very important conditional react. Don't go for the two alpha thing, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it, it also works for sure, because everything comes from those. But sum to product is very intuitive to solve this problem. You can have two. Two cosine alpha beta cosine alpha minus beta minus two sine alpha plus beta sine alpha minus beta plus three cosine square gamma. Try to remember in the high level mass competition, sum to product, product to sum, extremely important. Try to use them. Now I use the sum to product. In the last USA MO problem, we use the sum, we use the product to sum. Is it right? Still remember? In the last problem, we use the product to sum. Cosine B times cosine C equals to blah, blah, blah. Okay, check out from here. You can basically use the double angle. Now you can use the double angle formula. Now it goes to what Joey says. You can use the double angle formula. This is gonna be two minus sine sum plus alpha sine alpha minus beta. Is it right? This part. Two sine alpha minus beta equals two sine gamma, right? Because alpha, yeah, because R minus, I mean like beta minus alpha equals to gamma. So this is gonna be like minus two sine gamma. Is that right? And just try to adjust like the minus sign. So what is that? So that one says you're gonna have two, um, two sine gamma times sine alpha plus beta plus three cosine square gamma. Is it? That one was lesser or equal to two sine alpha three cosine square alpha. I'll just let this one to one, right? This one will lesser or equal to this. Well, come to here, you go back to 
exactly the same thing as the last problem. Don't forget, of course, cosine square gamma will equal to one minus square sine alpha, sine gamma. You're actually looking at a quadratic equation, which sine alpha should be from zero to one. Is it right? You guys follow me? Why zero to one? Because at the very beginning, I said, alpha, beta, gamma is from zero to two pi. So you do not have to take care of the minus one part. All the way, you have this zero to one. Is it? So you'll be able to find out the P max value will be equal to 10 over three. Any questions? I think this is an easy problem. It's more direct, at least. They don't really drag you, jump here, jump there. You follow my lead. As long as you do this construction at the very beginning, all the following part is pretty much you just do some calculation. So at this level, this will be considered as an easy problem. You guys follow me? It's, it is easy because you don't have to think too much. It's difficult because you have to think. Think is very expensive. Calculation, calculation is cheap. Is that it? Are you still with me? That is right. Okay. Okay, just like one more thing. For this level, the lecture, you don't have to follow me every single step for my every single problem, but you need to understand like a big direction. If you follow me for the big direction, we're good to go. Okay, you don't have to understand every single calculation is perfect, but like minor sign, positive sign, every single, no. This is not the rational where we come from. We want to teach you the way how to think rather than how to do the calculation. I'll give you the URL. I'll give you like the link. So you will re, so that's the reason why we give you every two lecture, every two weeks you have a lecture. You can go back, try to calculate yourself. That's not a big thing. Most important, let's follow me for course how to think for the problem. Okay, let's go for the last problem. Oh, I love the last problem. The last problem is a very elegant problem. Let's go for the last problem. The last problem is if you don't know, it takes you forever to figure out. If you know, oh my God, so easy. This is a German MO shortlist question. You know what, I'll, I'll, I'll change a new page. I love this question. What is that? Okay, this is 2006 German MO shortlist question. Let positive integers A and B co-prime. Please prove the following. You guys know this curvely, this is, this uh, square bracket means the Gauss function, right? You take the integer function. Is that right? This is like the, this is means the integer function of A over B. A over B take an integer, two A over B take an integer, all the way B minus one or times A take an integer equals to this. A minus one, B minus one. A co-prime means, a, a co-prime means a multiple of a uh, pairwise distinct, the, oh yeah, yeah, that's sure. That's the, like the modular, you're just talking about like the, yeah, like the modular arithmetic. Yeah, the co-prime so means that, yeah. All right, think about how those problems This one, if you do not use the construction, it's impossible for you to finish it. Almost like impossible. Like the floor or seating, uh, this is the floor. Most of the time we talk about floor, we barely talk about seating, yeah. Seating is weird, right? Floor is more intuitive. If you remove the floor bracket, you overcome. Okay, you know what? If you think about too, if you think too much about like the floor bracket thing, this is what you mean by graphical solution. Yes, this one you would use the graphic. Cause, yeah, because usually when you have a floor function, you just you just put on the graph and then you see the answer. Exactly. If you really try to get rid of floor, you go to the wrong direction. That's oh, that's gonna yeah. eat all your time. I think because if A is co-prime to B, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. 
then like each of these like it's kind of hard to explain but like a over b and 2a over b like a uh, mod b is different to 2a mod b which is different than 3a mm -hmm. mod b that's fantastic right, so you yeah. can you can count like exactly how much you over count when you remove the four uh, when you remove the four brackets, which is just one over B plus two over B all the way to B minus over B, which is actually just B minus one uh, uh, times B over two over B, which is just B minus one over two, all right? So you overcount by that much, and then you just take A over B plus two over B all the way to B minus one times A over B, and if you sum that all together, you get A times B minus one over two, and you subtract how much you've overcounted, which is just B minus one over two, right? I think that's a very direct way to solve this problem. Yeah, I think you're correct. Did you guys follow James? James basically figured out like, what is the definition of A over B floor? And then every time you overcount something, you put all the overcount things together, you might have like something, you know, some, some all the remainders, put them together, all the leftovers, put them together, you get what you need on the right-hand side. Wait, how, so how do you calculate the sum of how much you overcounted? I didn't do, because that's totally not my solution. But I'm so, trying to follow James' solution to figure out. Yeah, maybe I'll ask James to give more. Yeah, elaborate. So basically, because A and B are co prime, then each of these uh, B minus one fractions, uh, you overcount by like kind of like a, a different amount, if you think, right? So uh, we don't know which one, but one of these. Uh, one of these multiples of a is is congruent to one mod b, and one of them is congruent to two mod b. Exactly, one of them is congruent to three mod b, and so on, up to b minus one. Right. So, so we know that uh, like each multiple of a goes to a different uh, what's it called modular residue mod b. I think is that what it's called. So basically, you know that it's just uh, modular arithmetic. Yeah. You 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 overcount by one over b for one of them, and you overcount by two over b for another one, and then you just keep going. Oh, actually, although maybe this doesn't work when you consider when b minus one is greater than a, then you start repeating. Mm -hmm. yeah. Kind of uh, over. I don't think overcounting will work with coprime. Yeah. Okay. Wait. Never mind. That doesn't work. It only works <laughs> wait, if B no. is less than A. Yeah. I think it does work. I don't know. No. 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 James's overcounting only works when B is yeah. less. Yeah. Because yeah. when B is greater than A, then you start overcounting your overcount, and you don't know that yeah, exactly you have. So yeah, I, I think, think I get our point. Have, yeah. I think you still have to do the graph. I yeah, think. That, that's pretty much my solution. I think even though we go for James' solution, you need a, you, you really have to write a lot, right? You have to write a lot of English, try to explain what you're trying to do like this. I think it's a good solution. So I never, I never suppressing your solution. But uh, yeah, I think there may, might be a lot of explanation for this. So I'll give the, the solution that I know. I think it's a very arrogant solution. It's a very elegant solution, not very, very arrogant. Yeah, it's also a little bit arrogant because it's, it's a very weird solution. But you try to understand the, like, the beauty behind it, something like this. In order to solve this, you need to use the graph, right? So the graph, you know what? Like for this problem, you're really going to think out of the box. The graph talking about here is talking about the, what is it called? Like the lattice point. And you know the word? Lattice point. Hmm. Lattice point yeah. means the x, y, That's those two, both the right, those two kind of like, yeah, I skipped one question. I'm going to make that question for a, a homework for you. Okay. You're sharp. Okay. That's pretty sharp. Good catch. But that's like, question number eight. It's a crazy question. I hope you guys can figure it out by yourself. But if you don't, I'm not blaming you. Let's go back to that. Okay, so like the, okay, we're gonna use the lattice point. L lattice point means you have like two coordinates, they're both integers, not necessarily like a positive or negative, okay? Uh, question number eight is way more harder than the IMO. 
even though I read the official solution, it took me half an hour to understand what I'm trying to say. But I'll let you guess, maybe you guys can do it even better than me. It's a crazy, crazy construction. But just let's go back to question eight. Oh, wait, is the official solution a um, construction or? Yeah, like the official solution eight. is construction. Yeah, okay. the official solution. All the question I gave you is the official construction territory problems. Okay, okay. let's it, come to here. Yeah, yeah. Yes. It kind of looks like Ramanujan's nested um, is nested by. The, uh, 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 the, can you say that again? There was an Indian mathematician called mm -hmm. Srinivasa Ramanujan. Oh my and, God, he's and, like a god. He. Yeah. And this one reminds me of his uh, nested radicals. It looks like that. The the question eight. You you know the like the mathematician Andy talk about? Can you type his name? Because I don't really know how to type his name. He in his own life, he was like in I don't know. He lives like like a hundred years ago or something. I can't rem I can't remember. In in his entire life, he he gave us more than four hundred different conjectures. Listen this way, he come up with a like a formula. He said, I never know how to prove it, but my God told me. And of course, by the time then people think he's, he, 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 this is like a joke, right? But trust me, after 100 years, almost every single his expression, his formula has been proved to be true. He never gave any proof, but he told, he, he keeps saying that I got this in the dream. My God told me this is the right one. A lot of solution will be work for AI for some like kind of like genetic things, NASA things. By the time then, there wasn't even any topics there. He just dream it. So that's the one I think Andy mentioned about. That's a legend. Try to do a Google search for his name. He's a legend. So that's the reason why I say sometimes you, you need to dream out the solution. Who's the person who suggested that one plus two all the way to infinity equals negative one over twelve. But exactly that doesn't work though. Yeah, he has some problem. Yeah, he has some typo. Has some like yeah, he's not successful for every single one, but he has the majority one correct, which is insane. You can try to read his biograph and figure out what he did. That's my thing. I I, I watched his movie, <laughs> like a movie. It's called um The Man Who Knew Infinity, I think. I, I, I never see the document, but I think you're, but I know the man. That's a fantastic man. Yeah. And he has no prior training. Yeah, just like Leo mentioned, he has no, he, most of his formula get it from the dream. In, when he's pray, when he's, you know, something, he, he never did anything, pure training. Okay, but let's, let's, come on, let's come back to our question and we can just wrap it up. This problem, the solution is that you are trying to find out the lattice point. Lattice point, just like Joey mentioned, means you have an xy. The xy coordinates are both integers. Okay, that's the lattice point. So what I'm going to do is, let's let me have a look. I'm going to construct such a shape. So easy. This is a, b zero. This is c. 0a, a is here, b is here. So I have a line, ob, y equals to abx. Okay, let's talk about all the lattice point within the triangle, within the rectangle, abcd. Lattice points within the rectangle, abcd. Okay. Due to the symmetric nature, all the lattice point within this triangle and within this triangle, they should be the same number. Is that right? You guys follow me? Also, because A and B co-prime, there shouldn't be any lattice point that falls under this last segment, OB. Is that right? Because AB co-prime, there shouldn't be any lattice point force in the segment OB. That part, I'll give you some explanation. Co-prime is what? Let's say five, three. It means five and three is the only, is the smallest, smallest two integers I can find out to fit this, re this relationship, right? 
So let's say five, three. That's the smallest, the smallest integer I can ever find to make it happen. If I find another integer, x, y, it means that I can find another integer also x over y, but also in this point. So that means a, b does not co prime. You guys follow me? Yes or no? Yes. And what about the other guys? Not only, you know, everyone needs to be. Okay. Yeah, I see. If you don't understand, please let me know, okay? Because, yeah, right. I think if everyone says yes, I'm not gonna say too, too much. So that being said, all the lattice point within the triangle, within the rectangle OBCD will be evenly distributed between the upper triangle and the lower triangle. Okay, in total, how many lattice points in total within this rectangle? That one is easy. A minus B, A minus one, B minus one, right? This is total lattice point within this rectangle. If I divide it by two, this will be all the lattice point in the lower triangle. You guys follow me? Yes or no? Yes. So the right hand side is actually already done. I need to find out what are the lattice points in the triangle AOB, and my job is done. Is that right? So my million dollar question will come to here. How can I prove this guy will be all the lattice points that falls into triangle ABC, into triangle AOB, right? This is not a magic as well. Think about it. You're going to have a bunch of line x equals to 1, x equals to 2, all the way x equals to b minus 1. Is it right? This will be all the lattice lines which cuts the triangle. So this guy A over B, this. Actually, this guy stands for, in this line, x equals to 1, how many lattice points force under this A over B, is it right? You only, you want to find something, lattice means the, like the number under this. You guys follow me? So that being said, A over B, uh, Gauss function, means the lattice point under this guy, A over B. Second part, 2A over B, will be all the lattice point, all the positive integers lower than this A over 2A over B, right? So on and so forth. It works all the way to here. This is all the lattice points under this. So that being said, these are all the lattice points on the or should I say, in the lower end of this x equals to i, x equals to 1, 2, 3, 4, 4, 5, whatever points. So for sure, these two guys equal to each other. So far, so okay, good? Okay, wait, one thing. So, so does it include the points on the line? Right? This, this is not a very, yeah, for the boundary condition, I don't think it's a significant condition. So I don't, so this part for sure, mm -hmm. no. This part, no, because I'm, I'm actually talking about everything within. Okay, to, to answer your question, I'm talking about everything within this triangle it does not conclude all the boundary points. Let me answer this question directly. Okay. Nothing. Yeah, within. Because whenever I'm doing this, this is also within the triangle, not on the, uh, within the rectangle, not on the rectangle, right? Otherwise, we won't have A minus one and B minus one. So far, so good? Yeah. Okay. So, all right. I think that's pretty much what I want to say for today's lecture. We, you, we actually give you guys some uh, constructions. We, we, we're going to continue. Construction method, we're going to go for two lectures. 
because it's so important in the high level mass computation. Moving forward, we're going to give you guys more number theory related construction and counting and probability related construction. Okay, so this is going to be a lot more interesting or, or more crazy compared with this. Okay, in today's assignment, I'm going to give you again three problems. You have two weeks to do three problems. You can, you can imagine how these three problems look, look, looks like. And question number, like James said, we actually skip question number eight because number question number eight is super complicated. It's, um, you see the problem whenever you see the question, you figure out. So for the other students, I think the million dollar question is, all our lectures, our goal is not to let you guys understand every single word what I'm talking about. That's not where we come from. You need to understand the big, big directions. All the problems we're talking about, if you look at, at Amy, for sure, they're in the Amy complexity level. If you're looking for the Euclid, the question number 10, for pretty much question number 10 complexity level. So I think you can figure out where you, where you stand for these two, ex two exams. I didn't find out a very complicated, confusing question. I find out a relatively straightforward and brief problem that you guys focus on what we talk about today. I think that's wrap ups for today's lecture. Any problems, any questions for me? All good? No. All right. In that case, perfect. In that case, we'll wrap up the lecture. Stop um, yeah, okay. Per Okay, perfect. That wraps up after this lecture. And uh, I'll give you the assignment and I'll see you guys in two weeks. All right. So that's it. Thank you, guys. Hopefully, you enjoy the rest of our week. Talk to you later. Bye for now. Yeah, it's the same thing Google Classroom assignment, so on and so forth. Yeah. Normally, I'll, okay, so this is Thank how it works. Know. I'll give you, I will give you the access to this lecture. Let your parents talk to me. I'll give you the access. We're no longer using the YouTube. I'll give you a more encrypted way to get your to get your stuff. Read the lecture first. I'm not gonna give the assignment right away. You, you don't have to do it right away. You can understand the lecture once or twice before you jump to the assignment. That's it. All right. Bye bye. See you guys. Hopefully you enjoy today's lecture. We'll touch base later. Bye. Bye.